In most of our prior talks, we've been discussing various abnormal lung opacities. For this talk, we're going to be focusing on the opposite situation, when the lung looks abnormally lucent. Lung can look abnormally lucent when there's no lung parenchyma in an area, when there's too much air in the lung, or when there's not enough perfusion in the lung. There are three reasons why you'd encounter a situation where there's no lung parenchyma in an area. Um, the most common situation is emphysema, um, but the two other situations are cystic disorders within the lung. Some are congenital and some are acquired. When we talk about acquired cystic disorders in this talk, we're going to be focusing on four um, situations. Cystic lung disease, idiopathic disorders, honeycombing, and lung parenchymal disruption. And we're, trying to, we're going to try to go through each of these um, types of uh, lung hyperlucency. The most common one, um, emphysema, um, is a large topic that deserves its own talk. Um, so we're going to cover it separately in our COPD talk instead of as a part of this talk. Acquired cystic disorders, um, we're going to start with cystic lung disease. When we think about cystic lung disease, the four um, diagnoses I'd like to start with are cystic pneumocystis infection, LCH, LAM, and LIP. Um, as you study radiology further, um, you'll you know, obviously come to realize um, there's more cystic lung diseases than just these four. There are some more uncommon ones. Um, but for this talk, uh, we'd like to focus on the top four diseases uh, in white hair. The mechanism of cystic lung disease is um, basically the development of uh, an effective check valve at the distal bronchial level that permits air to enter when a patient breathes in, but prevents air from leaving um, when the patient tries to breathe out. Um, this kind of check valve mechanism uh, causes basically expansion um, of the distal air spaces um, or the, the air spaces uh, peripheral or distal from the, um, the check valve. This check valve in the distal bronchial um, is created by infiltration of the distal bronchial wall by something. That something uh, might be uh, granulomas um, and stuff in a case of cystic PJP um, or smooth muscle cells in a case of LAM. But the um, mechanism is all very similar. It's just the type of cell that's causing the distal bronchial wall infiltration, um, thickening, and creation of a check valve. Um, LAM. In LAM, um, smooth muscle cells infiltrate the walls of the terminal bronchioles, um, creating that check valve mechanism that leads to the development of lung cysts. Um, LAM, uh, in cases of LAM, uh, smooth muscle cells can also um, in infiltrate and occlude lymphatic um, vessels within the lung. Uh, this can lead to septal thickening due to impaired lymphatic drainage um, from the lung parenchyma, and even the development of chylus pleural effusions as that um, buildup of uh, lymphatic fluid has to go somewhere. There are two forms of LAM, uh, one that's associated with TS and one that is sporadic. The TS-associated form of LAM is much, much more common. Prognosis for LAM uh, tends to be poor in the long term. Um, management is sometimes lung transplant, but uh, patients have been known to recur um, in transplanted lungs. When we look at the morphology and the distribution of the lung cysts in LAM, the cysts are thin-walled generally round in shape. And in terms of their distribution, um, cranial caudally, um, there's really no substantial cranial caudal gradient. Um, size of um, cysts in uh, lamb can vary from small to medium, and the number can vary too. Um, you'll see cases where there's few and, few, and other cases where there are many cysts. Um, as we mentioned, some patients with phlegm uh, may also present with pleural fluid. And in cases of uh, TS-associated LAM, it's not uncommon uh, to see uh, renal AMLs, angiomyelopomas. Um, the demographic I tend to think of in, pa uh, in patients with LAM are generally women of uh, childbearing age. We've got a few examples of um, 
cystic um, lung um, disease from Lamb. Um, here's a case. So you see a couple of um, round, thin-walled cysts in the lung um, that are pretty small. Um, and in this case, we have also small, thin-walled cysts in the lung, but much, much more numerous. Um, cysts can be medium-sized or quite large at times um, in cases of Lamb. So you can see that the number and the size um, of these cysts can vary from patient to patient, but in general, um, their morphology is similar, uh, round, thin-walled cysts um, with no substantial um, upper or lower lung um, uh, predominance. In LCH, um, what happens are uh, Langerhans cells infiltrate the terminal bronchioles. Um, this leads to um, uh, increased granulomas, um, which cause the distal bronchial walls to thicken and create the check valve uh, mechanism that leads to um, cysts to form. In LCH, um, some of these uh, cysts may eventually coalesce. And as uh, cysts coalesce, they start forming larger cystic spaces that are more bizarrely shaped and not round and often thick walled. Um, you, remember, uh, you may remember that we um, mentioned LCH in our nonspecific lung nodule and mass talk. Um, that's because um, LCH um, can manifest um, in different ways in the lung, depending on whether you're early or late um, during its, uh, in its course of development. Um, early in development, the imaging features of LAM tend to be uh, more subcentimeter, kind of fuzzy, um, central lobular um, uh, located uh, nodules um, formed by these uh, kind of groups of granulomas. Um, but uh, as a patient progresses in their kind of disease course, um, the um, imaging features tend to be more cystic lung disease rather than subcentimeter nodules. The morphology and the cysts, the morphology and the distribution of um, the cysts in LCH um, are more variable than in LAM. Uh, you'll see cases where the walls are thin and you'll see cases where the walls are thick. Um, you'll see cases where the cysts are circular and you'll also see irregularly shaped cases. Um, the cysts in LCH have a upper lung predominance. Um, they vary in size from small through large and number can vary from few to many. Um, classically, the cysts in LCH um, generally spear the costophrenic angles. Um, there's no sex preference um, in terms of um, LCH, uh, but we do generally think of young to middle-aged um, adult smokers. Um, this is an example of LCH where we see um, lots of relatively thin-walled round cysts. Um, here's another case where you can kind of see um, a combination of some round cysts and some more um, unusually shaped cysts in the posterior lungs um, as some of these uh, probably smaller round cysts have begun to coalesce. Um, and here's a much more dramatic example of um, larger cysts that are really bizarrely shaped um, and kind of much thicker walled than the um, last examples. Um, you might have noticed on this um, uh, example, there's a pneumothorax on the left side. Um, one of the things uh, we we'll want to remind you is that um, cystic lung disease are always uh, associated with a risk of um, spontaneous pneumothorax. In LIP, um, lymphocytes are infiltrating the terminal bronchioles and leading to the um, development of the check valves. Um, that will eventually cause the cysts in the lung to form. Um, we see LIP in HIV patients and also in um, collagen vascular disease patients, uh, patients with Sjogren's, for example. The cysts in LIP are thin-walled, round, and have no substantial um, upper or lower lung predominance. Their size vary from small to medium. Um, you'll see cases with few and cases with many um, um, cysts. Um, in LIP, however, uh, you may remember um, this diagnosis had came, come up in our isolated ground glass opacity um, talk. That's because um, LIP cases are often associated with isolated ground glass opacities. So it's not unusual to see cysts and isolated ground glass um, in a patient's CT. LIP generally happens in middle-aged people and more often in women than men.
Here's an example of nice thin-walled round cysts in a patient with LIP, and a really dramatic example of lots of small thin-walled uh, round air cysts with really pronounced um, isolated ground glass. In cystic PJP, um, we basically um, will also um, encounter um, um, cysts, <clears throat> usually in a more advanced stage infection. Um, just to kind of recap, um, we usually see PJP in um, HIV um, populations with uh, low CD4 counts, and also in really immunosuppressed individuals um, uh, with like organ transplants um, or high dose steroids. Uh, with cystic PJP, uh, it's granulomas that are infiltrating the walls of the terminal bronchioles, leading to the creation of those check valves that cause the cysts in the lung. The cysts in cystic PJP are thin-walled, round generally, and have an upper lobe predominance. Their size vary from small to medium, um, and they, their number vary from few to many. And you'll typically see isolated um, ground glass opacities um, in these people. Um, here's a, a good example of cystic PJP. We see the isolated ground glass passes throughout the lungs and some relatively round, thin-walled, small cysts. Um, in this example, the cysts are much larger. And you'll see that this patient has um, bilateral pneumothoraces from this cystic uh, lung disease. So um, this summary chart um, goes through kind of um, the uh, different morphologies, uh, distributions, and demographic factors that we uh, alluded to. Um, this is basically, um, you know, some of the things we'll try to keep in mind when trying to diagnose a, um, a cystic lung disease patient. Um, you'll notice that there are going to be some imaging features that are much more helpful in reaching a specific diagnosis and some that are less helpful. So, for example, um, a patient who has um, thin-walled round cysts could have LAM, LCH, LIP or cystic PJP, uh, whereas um, a patient who has thick-walled, bizarrely shaped cysts um, most likely has LCH, as LAM, LIP, and PJP um, generally don't um, uh, result in cysts of that kind of morphology. Um, obviously, um, the things in the last row here are also helpful. Um, you know, if you're dealing with, you know, a smoker, um, you may kind of think of, you know, LCH a little bit more. Um, if you're dealing with a person who's uh, very immunosuppressed, um, you've got to wonder about PJP. The next um, group of acquired cystic disorders are the idiopathic disorders. And for that, um, for this section, um, I'd like to just um, kind of um, discuss um, a syndrome called Bert Hogg Dubé. Um, relatively rare, um, but seems to be um, somewhat common um, in the board setting, so we figure it's kind of a, maybe a useful one to put in this talk. Uh, Berthog Dubé is uh, known for um, the combination of lung cysts, um, skin hematomas, and renal tumors um, in patients. Uh, those tumors in the kidney could be oncocytomas or RCCs. Um, in people with uh, Berthog Dubé, though, uh, the lung cysts are a pretty common um, finding. The cysts in uh, Bert Hogg Dubé, um, as you can see in this um, coronal image, uh, are thin walled and um, markedly lower lung in their um, distribution. Um, here's a different example of a more irregularly shaped um, cysts. Um, the morphology and distribution of cysts in Bert Hogg Dubé, as you just saw, um, are generally thin walled, not thick, but the shape can be round or more bizarre. Um, and there is a marked lower lung predominance um, of the cystic lung disease in um, Bert Hogg Dubé. So um, uh, we'll just kind of update that uh, table we showed you just a few slides ago uh, with Bert Hogg Dubé. The third type of acquired cystic disorder um, we'll talk about is the phenomenon of honeycombing. Uh, we um, had alluded to honeycombing during the reticular interstitial uh, portion of one of our recent interstitial uh, lung um, opacity talks. Um, honeycombing represents lung remodeling um, in people with end-stage uh, reticular interstitial fibrosis. 
And as we uh, previously said, the differential diagnosis for honeycombing is the differential diagnosis for particular interstitial opacity or fibrosis um, because honeycombing is end-stage reticular interstitial fibrosis. So I'll tend to think about people with UIP, the rare cases of NSIP that go on to honeycomb, um, sarcoidosis, and fibrotic HP. Um, here are some examples of folks um, with um, UIP, in this case IPF, and honeycombing. You can see all the black um, spaces that are all kind of stacked upon each other in a background of really pronounced reticular interstitial opacity, especially in this case here. The fourth type of acquired cystic disorder are situations where the lung parenchyma has been disrupted. Disruption of the elastic tissues of the lung uh, result in basically three possible phenomena. Um, blebs, bully, and the um, occasional pulmonary laceration. Blebs and bully um, are fundamentally caused um, by decreased um, elasticity within the lung parenchyma, um, and sometimes with an added element of increased uh, intra-airspace pressures. Blebs are interesting. Um, they technically represent a dissection within the visceral pleura, um, leading to a collection of air within the visceral pleural layer. Um, so blebs are um, along the lung margin. Um, if we look carefully at patients with blebs, the visceral pleura um, may often be focally abnormal. Bullous lung disease, or bulla, uh, represent uh, distended air spaces as opposed to dissection of the visceral pleura. Uh, in cases uh, with uh, patients with bulla, generally the visceral pleura, immediately superficial, um, should be relatively normal in parents. Um, smaller bully, um, larger blebs, um, especially when both are peripheral, are pretty hard to distinguish from each other. Um, Folks try to sometimes use a one centimeter um, threshold for calling a bleb versus a bulla. But as you can imagine, um, there's probably no uh, fixed number that lets you be you know, very, very discriminatory between blebs versus bulla. Um, the population of people with blebs um, is a little bit more broad. Um, you'll see non-smokers um, with blebs, whereas um, generally uh, we don't see bulla in non-smokers um, that much. Um, for example, uh, blebs are not uncommon in younger, thin patients. Um, here's a CT example of a, of a couple of um, um, really kind of superficial blebs just beneath um, the visceral pleural surface, and a few cases of um, patients with bulla, this one quite, quite large. Um, the third scenario we mentioned um, in terms of, um, you know, uh, situations where a lung um, um, has been disrupted, lung parenchyma has been disrupted, um, is a pulmonary laceration. Uh, pulmonary lacerations occur when there's been a macroscopic uh, tear disruption of the lung parenchyma. Um, what results basically is a space as the um, lung parenchyma on both edges of that tear pull away. The space usually appears thin-walled. Um, they can be single or multiple in number and unilocular or multilocular, um, depending on um, you know what were the details or what happened during that injury. Um, obviously, depending on how severe the tear is, they can be smaller, they can be large, and it's not unusual to see um, the imaging findings of contusion uh, in the area of the laceration uh, because presumably there's may have been some sort of traumatic insult to the lung in that area. Um, because these um, um, disruptions are not only interrupting um, air spaces and maybe even some small airways, but potentially um, blood vessels. Um, pulmonary lacerations can sometimes fill with blood and look relatively opaque. Um, if that happens, especially in a sea of consolidation, the pulmonary laceration may not be immediately uh, recognizable on a, on a chest CT. Um, it's very hard for uh, the tear to kind of re-adhere itself, and so um, these pulmonary lacerations can persist for quite a long time. Um, here's a, an example of a small pulmonary laceration. Um, pulmonary lacerations generally tend to be more ovoid or ellipsoid in shape because the tear itself is usually linear and then 
uh, lung pulls away from both edges. That kind of forms a more um, ovoid or ellipsoid shape. Moving on to congenital cystic disorders from our acquired cystic disorders. Um, there's basically um, three um, disorders here um, we'll discuss that could result in a lucent looking lung, lucent looking lung region. Um, bronchogenic cysts, once the fluid has left, and we'll kind of describe that in a moment. Uh, uninfected intralobar pulmonary sequestrations can result in a lucent area of lung, and uninfected CPAMs can also result in a lucent area of lung. Bronchogenic cysts, how do they occur? Um, these are congenital disorders. Um, so in some rare cases, um, a bud forms from the tracheal bronchial tree as it's kind of um, branching and differentiating during embryogenesis and separates off. Uh, create its own little kind of space. Um, this is what leads to the development of a bronchogenic cyst. Um, folks say that about half of these are filled with, filled with uh, simple fluid, and the other half are not. Uh, that fluid could be something proteinaceous or, or hemorrhagic in those patients. Um, most bronchogenic cysts are asymptomatic, and so um, oftentimes they're just instantly discovered when we're doing a CT for some other reason. Um, they tend to be uh, well circumscribed, uh, round, and thin walled, but their size can vary uh, from small to large. There's a pretty wide range of sizes. Um, most bronchogenic cysts uh, live um, in the mediastinum and hyla, and the crine is a, a popular location, um, like this one here. And this one's much bigger than the one we just showed you. There's a few other examples of uh, bronchogenic cysts um, in a more conventional mediastinal location. On occasion, um, bronchogenic cysts can also form in the lung. Uh, we refer to those as intrapulmonary bronchogenic cysts. Occasionally, these intrapulmonary bronchogenic cysts can become infected. Uh, when that occurs, uh, the cyst may actually uh, become larger um, and not quite so clearly, uh, cleanly well circumscribed uh, while it's infected. And sometimes uh, a communication occurs with the tracheobronchial tree uh, between the cyst and the, the tracheobronchial tree. Um, if that thing sort of happens, um, you have the possibility of fluid from the cyst leaving um, into the tracheobronchial tree and also having air introduced into it. Um, when this kind of phenomenon occurs, um, it's often possible to ultimately be left with just the wall of the cyst, the bronchogenic cyst in the lung, um, but really not much fluid, and it's just an air-filled space. And that's how an intrapulmonary bronchogenic cyst can occasionally uh, be the reason for um, an abnormal lucency in the lung. Intrapulmonary sequestrations, um, you may remember from our um, uh, specific lung nodule and mass um, talk, um, they're basically a situation where an area of lung parenchyma doesn't go undergo um, complete differentiation during embryogenesis. And what you're left with is a primitive area of lung parenchyma that may have some um, communications with the rest of the tracheobronchial tree, albeit um, abnormal. Um, they're divided into two types, the intralobar ones and the extralobar ones. And it's the intralobar ones that can sometimes be responsible for um, presenting as an abnormally uh, lucent area of lung. Um, generally, um, intralobar pulmonary sequestrations live um, at the posterior lung basis, and they're known to be different than normal lung parenchyma because they derive their arterial supply from um, the systemic arterial uh, circulation as opposed to the pulmonary um, arterial circulation. Um, however, they are similar to normal lung in that their venous drainage is into the pulmonary rather than the systemic venous system. When intralobar pulmonary sequestrations are uninfected, um, they'll look lucent and bubbly, um, like this example here, and uh, responsible for an area of hyperlucency. Um, you know, in cases where um, the feeding artery is not small, especially if you have contrast, um, you might be able to see um, the specific feature that um, helps define an intralobar sequestration on imaging of systemic arterial supply. Here's another example of an area of lucency within the lung caused by an intralobar pulmonary sequestration, an uninfected one. 
and you can see it here on this coronal view. And on the uh, kind of uh, little bit of MPR imaging we've done here, you can actually see the uh, systemic arterial um, vessel actually supplying this area of lung. CPAMs. Um, CPAMs are another um, sort of congenital uh, anomaly in the lung. Um, this one uh, caused by just an overgrowth of blind ending um, uh, bronchi or bronchioles uh, with no kind of uh, development of more kind of normal uh, distal uh, lung tissue like alveola and stuff like that. Um, there are different types of CPAMs, um, generally categorized according to the size of these cysts in the CPAM. Um, there are the type 1 CPAMs that are usually um, have relatively large size cysts. Um, they can be single or multiple. Um, type 1 CPAMs is a really, really nice large example one here. Um, then there are type 2 CPAMs, which also may be responsible for an area of lucency in the lung. Um, in this case, the cysts are less than 2 centimeters in size uh, and usually a multiple. Um, they have a very, very kind of bubbly appearance that's a little bit um, similar to what we see with um, some intra-lobar pulmonary sequestrations. Um, they tend to be more specific of a call we can make when it's in an upper lung, since it's unusual to see um, sequestrations in the upper lungs. Uh, CPAMs, I guess, in the lower lungs are maybe a little um, tougher to distinguish from an intralobar sequestration, um, in that sometimes those guys may have such a small blood vessel supplying them from the aorta that you can't see it on a CT scan. So that covers, um, I guess, um, the spectrum of causes of abnormal um, lung lucency, um, where the cause is just an absence of lung tissue. Um, sometimes um, the abnormal uh, increased lung lucency is due to just more air than usual in a region of lung. And there's two scenarios I can think of um, when this can happen. Um, one of the situations occurs when you may have a relatively proximal um, occlusion of um, uh, airway um, supplying an area of lung. Um, let's take a, a sublobar uh, obstruction like the one I've drawn here. Um, obviously, I'm careful not to have drawn a, I guess, a lobar one because that would just probably lead to obstructive analysis. But with a sublobar um, obstruction, um, what happens often is that um, the um, region of lung that would have been supplied by that obstructed airway still may become filled with air, but via the phenomenon of collateral air drift, where air enters that region of lung, not via the efficient tracheobronchial tree, but rather through small little um, 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 air uh, pathways. Uh, we refer to those as like uh, uh, pores of Kuhn and canals of Lambert that permit molecules of gas to move from one segment to another without having to travel through that tracheobronchial tree. This tends to be a, uh, a, a kind of a method of flow, this collateral air drift, if you will, that's a little bit more efficient um, uh, during inspiration than expiration. So what happens is you tend to bring in gas slowly into the um, you know, area of lung uh, through collateral air drift, but it's a little harder pushing it out. And so you'll often see um, air trapping um, um, peripheral to a proximal airway occlusion. And you'll notice that that area of lung will look a little bit more expanded and a little bit blacker than the normal lung parenchyma nearby. We could also encounter um, air trapping um, when something uh, occludes the airways much more distally. Um, in this kind of scenario, um, you might be able to bring air into the lung, but for whatever reason, when you try to breathe out, um, perhaps uh, those distal airways uh, collapse or occlude, uh, preventing you from pushing all the air out. And so that effectively results in you know, an area of uh, air trapping. Um, when it comes to uh, you know, air trapping, uh, we can categorize uh, the disorders that cause air trapping, um, perhaps according to uh, where the airway occlusion occurs. So um, when it comes to causes of air trapping due to more proximal airway occlusion, um, the air trapping is primarily due to collateral air drift. Um, in cases where um, the occlusion is solitary, 
Um, I think of causes such as a big mucus plug, um, a foreign body, um, occasionally an endobronchial neoplasm or, or a congenital anomaly uh, uh, known as bronchial atresia, where a segment of the uh, more proximal bronchus is atretic. Um, the imaging finding in those cases uh, that will really kind of seal the deal is basically a combination of uh, air trapping and a um, solitary, uh, visible, relatively central endobronchial opacity um, corresponding to that area of air trapping. Sometimes um, these proximal airways can, um, occlusions can, um, can be multifocal, uh, resulting in multifocal air trapping. Um, good examples are um, non-tubercular mycobacterial infections, ABPA, and cystic fibrosis. Um, the imaging hallmark here will be um, areas of multifocal air trapping that are associated with bronchiectasis. Um, sometimes uh, we'll see air trapping not due to proximal airway occlusion, but more distal airway occlusion. Um, examples are um, uh, disorders like non-fibrotic HP and RB. Um, in those uh, disorders, uh, you'll see uh, multifocal air trapping, sometimes diffuse air trapping, um, in the setting of a century lobular um, interstitial pattern. Asthma and constrictive bronchiolitis are two other causes of uh, air trapping due to distal airway occlusion, and they can also occur in a multifocal or diffuse distribution. But as for asthma and constrictive bronchiolitis, there are often no other associated imaging findings. And so sometimes the only imaging finding of witness is the evidence of the air trapping. This is an example of bronchial atresia in the anterior right lung. Um, you may recognize that a region of the anterior uh, right lung looks a bit blacker um, than the other areas of lung on the image. And then there's a thick kind of tubular structure. It's a little bit bubbly um, that's in this area of uh, lucency. Um, that's a big uh, mucus plug um, upstream from uh, an atretic uh, bronchial segment. And the reason why the lung looks black in this region is because air is getting to um, the lung parenchyma that corresponds to where this atresia occurred, but it's getting there through collateral air drift um, from other um, patent airways. Um, air is flowing into this area that's downstream of this occlusion and the big mucus plug, but not leaving very efficiently. Here's a case of a non-tubercular mycobacterial infection, and you might see some segments of lung that look slightly blacker than other segments. And you'll see some of these airways are not quite healthy, thick-walled and mucus plug filled. Those are bronchiectatic airways. Um, here's a case of cystic fibrosis with similar findings. And the last picture I'll show you is a picture of non-fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, there's some areas of lucency uh, that represent air trapping um, in the setting of a indistinct faint central lobular pattern. Now, we mentioned that uh, sometimes lung can be abnormally lucent, uh, not because there's too much air, but there's not enough, or there's less blood than usual, perfusions decreased. So abnormal, um, uh, abnormally decreased um, lung um, lucent, uh, sorry, Increased um, uh, lung lucency can sometimes occur uh, because we're not uh, pushing enough blood into that area of lung. Um, diseases like chronic PE, pulmonary arterial hypertension um, can cause this to occur, usually in a more bilateral, symmetric sort of way. Uh, we can see um, hypoperfusion resulting in more lucent lung in a more asymmetric or unilateral distribution in disorders like a acute large PE or PAPVR. This is a CT image of a patient with chronic PE. And what you may recognize is there are some areas, regions of lung that look a bit blacker. Um, these areas of blacker lung are not emphysema. Um, you can actually see there's still lung parenchyma there. It's not due to air trapping, but rather it's because those areas of lung are just seeing less blood flow because of chronic um, PE. Um, here's an example of GPA, um, similar situation where 
there's impaired perfusion to some areas of lung which look a little bit more black. In this case, the cause is um, impaired perfusion, not because of a chronic PE, but because of um, GPA um, process playing out and occluding the vessels. This is a very interesting um, example. Um, you can just barely see, even though this is a lung window, um, a large occlusive left-sided PE. And if you look at the two lungs, the left lung looks a little bit blacker than the right lung. And that's because the entire left lung is seeing much less perfusion because of the large PE. So decreased pulmonary perfusion can lead to um, abnormal lucency within the lung. And those are the main reasons. So that completes our kind of uh, a tour um, of the different kinds of disorders that we think about uh, when the lung looks abnormally lucent. We think about situations where there's an absence of lung tissue, when there's too much air or too little blood. So how do we take all of this that we learn and apply it in the reading room? Um, here's how we'll do it. Uh, when you recognize some well-defined region or regions of abnormally loosened lung on a chest CT, ask yourself, are these many in number and bilateral? or are they single or few in number and relatively asymmetric? If they're single and few in number and relatively asymmetric, what's the territory uh, of involvement like? Is it a local area or a more regional area? Um, if it's a local area, um, I'd start thinking about the differential diagnoses in violet here. And the things I would think of if the region looks very unilocular, um, a simple bubble, if you will, um, are going to be things like blevs and bully, uh, pulmonary laceration that's all air-filled, a bronchogenic cyst where all the fluid might have left and we're just left with just an air-filled um, bronchogenic cyst wall, and those large type 1 CPAMs. If um, the interior of that cyst is more multilocular and more complex, more bubbly, I'm going to be thinking of an uninfected intralobar pulmonary sequestration or an uninfected type 2 CPAM. If this uh, single uh, or few regions of, um, you know, lucency are more regional in territory, um, I'm going to think about the diagnoses in blue here. If I don't see a mucus plug associated with it, I might be thinking about, could I be seeing a case of a large PE uh, resulting in a just a region of um, hyperperfused lung, or PAPVAR, um, probably a more uh, unusual explanation. Um, neither of those is an airway disease, so obviously we wouldn't expect to see mucus plug. And if I see this same regional uh, area of hyperlucency um, in the setting of a mucus plug, um, it could just be because there's a thick mucus plug there, um, and that's just by itself causing um, air trapping. Um, sometimes uh, it could be because there's a foreign body in the airway and there's a mucus plug that's formed behind it, or not. Um, mucus plug forming behind it um, and air trapping um, upstream from it. Um, it might not be a foreign body, but maybe an endobronchial neoplasm or bronchial atresia that accomplishes the same result. And so um, if I see a region of abnormally lucent lung with an associated mucus plug, it's these four things that um, I'll think about. Now, if um, on my CT imaging, um, the lucencies are many in number and bilateral, we're going to start thinking about cystic lung diseases that we discussed earlier in this talk. And the five things that I'll put on my list are, is this a case of LAM? And remember, there are the sporadic cases and the more common uh, TS-associated cases. Is it a case of LCH, LIP, cystic PJP, or uh, the rare boards case of uh, Berthog de Bay? Um, I'll use um, the morphology and the distribution of the cysts to help me a little bit. But oftentimes, um, the demographics and the history that you kind of see in the last uh, row here tend to be very useful too. Now, one thing we kind of left sort of unaddressed was um, how do you know that you're looking at an abnormal uh, region of lucent lung? Uh, 
Um, obviously, in cases where there's just an absence of lung parenchyma, um, it's pretty um, easy to recognize. Um, or if the region is relatively small relative to what's presumably a background of all normal lung, or even if it's slightly larger, or if there's a few small regions. Um, in these situations, it's relatively easy for you to recognize, um, you know, um, you know, that there's a abnormal area of hyperlucency uh, where the lung looks a little bit blacker on these images. Sometimes, however, it's not quite so easy. Um, take this example here. If you were just looking at this, um, when the distribution of uh, darker and, and whiter uh, lung become relatively equivalent in amount, and neither is very, very markedly abnormal, um, it becomes a little bit difficult. Um, we refer to these kind of situations, situations as a mosaic attenuation pattern. Um, with a mosaic attenuation pattern, you're often asking yourself, am I dealing with a situation where the blacker lung is normal and the whiter lung represents isolated ground glass opacity? Or is it reversed where the whiter area is normal lung and the blacker area is hyperlucent lung? In which case, then we would have to kind of use some of the um, lessons we discussed in this talk. How do we tell the difference? Um, the best way to tell um, relatively definitively is um, through the use of inspiratory and expiratory phase imaging. Um, and depending on if the mosaic attenuation pattern becomes more accentuated or not, and also um, depending on how the blood vessels in the darker versus the whiter areas look compared to each other, we can usually have a better idea what's really happening. So um, if you see a mosaic attenuation pattern in the lung, and it looks more conspicuous on the expiratory phase imaging than the inspiratory phase imaging, um, you're most likely going to suspect it's multifocal air trapping you're dealing with. And if you look carefully, you might realize that the blood vessels in the darker areas will tend to be smaller and fewer uh, than in the more white areas of lung. It turns out that this tends to be the most common uh, reason why we see mosaic attenuation pattern um, on uh, most patients. If we see this, um, our differential diagnosis um, will depend a little bit on what other things we might see. So if you see multifocal air trapping in the setting of, say, a sensory lobular nodular pattern, um, you're going to be biased towards diseases or disorders like HP or, or respiratory bronchiolitis. You got the same imaging findings in the setting of bronchiectasis and mucoid impaction. You're more likely going to think of things like MAI, ABPA, and cystic fibrosis. If you don't see anything, and it's otherwise a relatively clean lung, um, maybe it's a case of asthma or constrictive bronchiolitis that you're dealing with. Now, sometimes when you do this expiratory inspiratory phase imaging, the mosaic attenuation pattern doesn't look more conspicuous on the expiratory phase imaging. In that situation, the reason for the mosaic attenuation pattern is, may not be multifocal air trapping, but either one of the two um, situations on the middle and the right column here. Um, either it's because um, you're dealing with a situation where there's uh, multifocal areas of hypoperfusion or multifocal areas of ground glass. And you're going to try to distinguish which one is more likely at that point by looking at how the pulmonary vessels in the darker areas look compared to the whiter areas. If there's smaller, fewer blood vessels in the darker areas in this kind of situation, I'm going to suspect I'm dealing with a multifocal hypoperfusion situation. And then think about differentials like a chronic PE, um, for example, or pulmonary hypertension. If, on the other hand, the blood vessels look the same in number and size in both the blacker and the whiter areas, and in a setting where, you know, the mosaic tension pattern did not look more conspicuous on expiratory phase imaging, I'd wonder that perhaps I'm dealing with a multifocal isolated ground glass opacity situation, in which case we'd refer to the isolated ground glass opacity workflow that we discussed earlier.